Hi class, welcome to lecture three, part B. So we just discussed four different types of federalism. Now we're gonna go on, keep talking about federalism. We're gonna talk about the good and the bad aspects of federalism. So let's start with the good. Um, we talked about this before. Federalism allows certain states to create laws that work for them while still being unified as a country. Again, remember the differences between a state like New York and Texas. Would New York laws work in Texas? No. Would Texas laws work in New York? Absolutely not. So federalism allows them to have unique governments at the state and local level that work for them. It also allows for a lot of innovation and experimentation at local levels. So instead of rolling out a broad national program, you can test things at the local level and see if they work. And if they work, you roll them out nationally. If they don't work, you end them and it's less collateral damage. It also uh, arguably allows for the protection of individual rights, uh, such as the right to vote and marriage. Think about uh, gay marriage, right? Gay marriage was illegal in every single state as of 2003, all right? If, if it didn't progress state by state, it might've taken a lot longer to be legalized federally, which happened in 2016 with the case, Supreme Court case over Bell v. Hodges, okay? So some more liberal states allowed gay marriage in their states, and then it started to grow by there as a public opinion started to change. So in that way, it can be beneficial and then it creates a more just and equal society. Let's talk about the bad now. Some of the bad, arguably, again, you might look at this as a, a good thing, but states sometimes ignore national laws, right? We see that in California quite a bit. We see it with marijuana laws, right? Federally, marijuana is legal, and we'll go into that more in a second. But in California, it's recreationally legal. So technically, every time you buy marijuana in California, you're breaking federal law. Um, also, and again, you might say this is a good or a bad thing, uh, Cal immigration, California is a sanctuary state. Um, it ignores federal immigration laws, certain federal immigration laws. Okay, so it's not necessarily bad that they do that, but where it can be tricky is that it creates conflict between the state and federal governments. Also, states may sometimes pass questionable or very stupid laws. Um, again, California is a pretty good example of this. We sometimes pass laws with terrible foresight. We once passed a law saying Amazon didn't have to pay any federal um, income tax, I believe it was, um, which was very foolish, but not to go down that rabbit hole. And again, federal and state laws sometimes clash like with marijuana and immigration, et cetera. Another instance of a perhaps negative result of federalism is something called spillover. This is when the laws of one state spill over and have an impact on other states. Let me give you a couple examples here. Um, I use a marijuana example here, but I think a more uh, topical example might be gun control, right? California has very strict gun laws. States like Nevada and Arizona do not. So what will sometimes happen is California citizens will drive to Arizona or Nevada, buy weapons or ammunition or magazines that are legal there, but illegal here, and simply bring them back across the border to California where they're illegal. So this affects California perhaps negatively because there's more law breaking going on. This is spillover. Same thing with marijuana. People drive all the time over the, over the state line buy marijuana where it's legal and take it back home where it's illegal, which can cause hassles for that police force um, and the legal system there. Okay, so it's important to point out that federalism is a power sharing structure, right? It's a power sharing structure between state and federal governments. There are alternative power sharing structures that some countries in the world operate under. Two of those are confederations and unitary systems. Let's talk about confederations first. A confederation is a system in which the states or the smaller units of government have more power than the central government. And we've talked about the system before when we talked about the Articles of Confederation. The US under the Articles of Confederation was a confederation. So be sure not to get federalism mixed up with confederation. Um, a confederation is when the states or the outer units have more power than the central government. Opposite to that is a unitary system. This is when the central government has essentially all the power and the states have very little to no power, okay? A good example of that would be China, right? China has a very, very strong centralized government. They have regional governments, but they have pretty much no power whatsoever. So this chart should help you out to distinguish these three types of power sharing structures, unitary, federal, and confederal systems. Let's start with unitary. Let's say that the small dots represent 
the smaller units of government in the United States, that'd be the states, and the big dot represents the federal or centralized government. You can see in a unitary system, the central government has all the power and controls the outer units of government, the states in our case. In a federal system, which is what we have, power is shared between the states and the centralized government. And in a confederation, power is mainly in the hands of the outer units of government, or in our case, it would be the states. So make sure you know the difference between these three types of power sharing structures. So the perfect example of federalism in the United States and in California is probably marijuana. There's other examples. This is a marijuana leaf, which I'm sure you all know. Watch this short video. I'm not gonna make it mandatory, but it kind of goes into, this is from when it was medicinally legal, but not recreationally. And it talks about a, a marijuana grower and his fear that he'll be arrested for essentially breaking federal laws, which is a schedule three drug, um, very illegal. So just to kind of give you an overview, um, in California, it's recreationally and medicinally legal. We voted for that. Um, on a federal level, it's still schedule one. Sorry, I said schedule three earlier. I meant schedule one. Uh, other drugs that are in schedule one, I believe is like cocaine and methamphetamines. So it's considered a serious drug by the federal government, which is foolish, but let's, we don't need to talk about that. So different administrations, um, have different policies on marijuana. Obama, for example, didn't really enforce federal marijuana laws. Trump didn't really either. I say, we'll see how Trump will handle the issues. We've seen it. He didn't, you know, it was a short, I expected another term perhaps. So I didn't update the slide. Um, but, you know, we'll kind of see how he, or how Biden handles the issue as well. And in the last three presidents have really kind of ignored it. So that seems to be the trend. Maybe someday it will be federally legal, but. You have to remember there are also very conservative states that perhaps do not want marijuana to become legal. Um, so what is important to remember about federalism? Again, federal law trumps state law. So if you're breaking a federal law, even if you're in a state where that's legal, you can potentially be prosecuted in federal court. Now, don't worry, they're not going to, you know, the DEA is not going to break down your door because you're smoking a joint, right? But if you're running a, a huge grow operation, they can raid your facilities, they can raid your stores, and they've done it in the past. Um, and you can and will be prosecuted at the federal level. And the state can really do nothing about it because again, federal law trumps state law. So that's gonna do it for lecture three, part B. Thanks for tuning in. I will speak to you guys very soon.